Hi everyone. Uh, this is Ken Vandermark, and this is Jim O'Rourke for the first Hello. <laughs> for the first of uh, the uh, 2021 Option Series program uh, presented by Experimental Sound Studio. Uh, this part of the year will be uh, included in their quarantine concerts. I want to thank uh, them very, very much for all they've been doing for the music and for musicians. Uh, thanks to Alex Inglesian for helping out with the tech tonight. And a big shout out to Tim Daisy and Andrew Klinkman who helped me with the programming of the series. Uh, in the, we opened up with the uh, pretty intensive music of Georg Friedrich Haas. Uh, Jim has been kind enough to put together a really incredible, uh, let's say mixtape playlist in the background and we'll be talking about a bunch of things as that ebbs and flows behind us hey jim thanks so much for being here and getting up early in japan to do it <laughs> <laughs> thank you for thinking of me this is, uh, i would only have done this for you you know this is my this is my first first time appearing on the internets wow okay well we'll try to make it we'll try to make it enjoyable for you so you might want to do it again uh with someone um Jim's, uh, you're one of the most forward-thinking people I know, musically and otherwise. And uh, when we're talking before, uh, uh, just now before going live, you you uh, wanted to take a look back at the Chicago period you were involved in. I thought that would be really amazing. Uh, we knew each other in that time as well, and uh, I learned a lot from you in that period, and was lucky enough to do a little bit of work with you. So I don't know what would you like to start going over. From that well, time, there was one thing, a little bit of trivia. We met, I mentioned it before, but like my first job as a recording engineer was actually at ESS. Oh, yeah, sometime in the late 80s. And I, I so hello, Lou. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember if I got fired or not, but but I do, I uh, but uh, I was going to DePaul at the time, okay. And uh, in up until like I think the mid 80s. Uh, New Music America still existed, which was this, uh, maybe a lot of people don't know what that was, but it was, until like the mid 80s, like, you know, there was sort of a well, I, well, I don't want to say well funded, but relatively health, healthy new music kind of culture in America. You know, I mean, the, the music was being released by reputable labels and, and, uh, there were some like sort of crossover stars, you know, like Steve Reich and all that stuff. But there was this festival every year called New Music America. And my memory might be not completely correct on this, but it may have moved from city to city each year. But there were a few in Chicago that I remember like, going to when I was in high school. And uh, so like uh, Robert Ashley's Atalanta opera was there and there that's also where that sort of famous uh feud between glenn bronca and john cage happened oh. uh, uh bronca played at at new music chicago down on the lake shore somewhere i forget and then on a radio interview either the same day or the next day john cage was like you know like this is this is not you know this is fascism music or so whatever so i'm just sort of setting the tone that there was a, this sort of uh sort of i mean it was fading out i don't think i realized at the time but like culture was event eventually fading out but uh ess sort of came out came up during that time and there was uh so lower there's no links at all anymore is there lower no, links lower, lower links is gone yeah so there was there was upper links. Yeah, Lynx first. Hall moved over to uh, kind of like uh, share space with a place called Constellation. So Lynx Hall is kind of still going, uh, connected oh. to movement dance uh, productions. Yeah. So at that time there was there was Lynx Hall, which, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, was being run by Eric Leonardson. All and, right. And. Um, Mike Zarang. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so the, there was a, there was like this kind of like, a, at that time in Chicago, there was like this triumvirate of like, you know, the big funded things like New Music America and all that. And then Lynx Hall and, and then ESS. And of course, it was also like South End Music Works and stuff like that, which was who, 
that was probably your first connection to Chicago, right? So yeah, South End. South End, yeah, yeah. Which was, Although Links Hall, Links, uh, Lower Links was too, because that was right yeah. around the corner from where I lived. So wow. I saw I saw a lot of shows there because it was right there. Yeah, and I just Lower sort of Links. Lower Links opened up uh, like maybe mid to late eighties, about. Yeah, I got here in September of '89, and it was in existence then. And yeah. that was run by I think I think a, a a woman named Lee Jones. Yeah, Lee Jones did it. Yep. Mm -hmm. And was, if I remember, uh, Stuart Stuart Sundell. That sounds familiar, but I don't remember. I think he was the curator. So so all that stuff was and. It, at that time, Upper Links and Lower Links were in the same building. And that was really interesting because, you know, Upper Links would have, like, Upper Links and, and ESS sort of represented that, like, where that world of, like, new music and funded new music and all that stuff sort of crossed over into the underground. So, like, uh, Upper Links, you'd have, like, Eugene Chadborn playing there, like, every two days, you know? <laughs> and <laughs> But then that stuff sort of moved down to, to Lower Links. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, I mean, I guess, I guess the, so you came in 89 mm -hmm. and at that time was, was Southwark still being put together? Was it Leo Krumpholz? Yeah, man, you have a great memory. Yeah. Leo Krumpholz was the main person there and South and Music Works for a little while, I think kind of just, it was like a club, like a London club, where they would do yeah, shows romantic. at different venues. Yeah. And then they opened up the spot on uh, South Wabash, like 1300 South Wabash. And that there was, was an actually... Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, you just reminded me. There was one other place. Oh, it was called, like, the Light Bulb or... Oh. Light Bulb? No, it wasn't the Light Bulb. I'll remember it in a minute. But mm -hmm. uh, I didn't realize South End Music Works ever had a... Yeah, an actual yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, candlestick maker? What's what's that? No, that was the candlestick maker was later. That was Michael uh, Zarang's spot. Uh, he ran that for several years, and that was uh, that was post two thousand. So we're we're talking pre two thousand. Yeah, this is this is a place in Ace. I played I played I played there only once. I played with Henry Kaiser in nineteen ninety. Oh, okay. But that place would have things like uh, like uh, Steve Tibbetts played there, oh. and. Uh, but I forgot what the name of that place. That place, uh, Looking but Glass, was it the yes, the what? Looking Glass, the yeah. Looking Glass. That's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, I mean, uh, the the South End Music Works things were sort of like a big deal then, uh, mm -hmm. and they were always. I mean, I was still fairly young. I was like either end of high school or in college, probably in college by this point. But it was still like. A lot of the shows were places my parents didn't want me to go. <laughs> Parts of the town that yeah, yeah. my 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 uh, good Irish parents were not, <laughs> not not necessarily. So I remember. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't actually remember the geography of the city very well, but uh, there was a guy named Perry Venson, uh, who was also connected with Upper Links, uh, and he worked a lot with. Uh, I think I don't think he was in Leof Munamulla, but he was in some group with 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 Mr. Zarang and okay. Eric Leonardson. Okay. And so he had a loft in the what then would be uh, you, what's the area that doesn't exist anymore because they built a university there. Well. Uh, but anyway, down there, hmm. and so like that was my first entry into the, it was like the first physical like not evidence but like experience i had with like sort of like loft life you know mm -hmm. that i'd read about like in, in the 60s in new york and stuff and uh so and also the show i remember specific i remember it was probably a it was hans reichel and tom cora show that south end music works put on it's the same show that's on that fmp cd oh wow that was yeah that that was like down in like one of these like lofts down in if you said the name of the area, I might get it, but it doesn't matter now. It's, I mean, I'm sure geographically, you probably, it's probably completely different now. Yeah, probably. <laughs> it's changed so, a lot. But I never, uh, I'm sorry, you, oh, you're, it's horrible that I forgot his name. 
Uh, is it the Velvet Lounge? Oh yeah, Fred Anderson, Velvet Lounge. Yeah, yeah Fred Anderson. Now that went all that went way back, right? Oh yeah, I mean they, he he had a spot um, uh, up in Evanston for a while, was organizing shows up there, and then he had the Velvet Lounge. And I don't remember when the Velvet Lounge started, but that definitely was like a key spot uh, for for people I worked with and played with, and I played yeah. there a bunch. Yeah, that was super super active for the. Fred Fred's, uh, was amazing, and the contributions he made, not only as a musician, but having that spot and making yeah. it available for all kinds of players is incredible. So when you first came to Chicago, what what was your connection here? No, not here, uh, there. <laughs> um, I was trying to figure out what to do. I've been living in Boston after I went to university in Montreal, and I wanted to go somewhere else. I just felt like I needed to go somewhere else. And at that time, and I was already committed to playing, you know, working on the music I wanted to play and doing original stuff. Um, and the options at that time that were most vibrant as far as I, I knew them was there was a scene in San Francisco that was going on that was pretty active. It was, of course, the New York scene. And I didn't want to move to the West Coast. Mm. And my experience in Boston led me to believe that being in the Northeast was just not for me. And mm -hmm. that if I didn't like Boston, New York would be like whatever that right. was okay. exponentially more intense. And now I know differently, like they're very, very different places. Yeah. I mean, New York's changed an immense amount, uh, obviously, but, but at that time they w would have been very different places. Um, and the other option was Chicago. I knew Chicago had a really active uh, music scene and I had friends who, from uh, from college who lit, uh, were from Chicago and moved back here. And one of them was a drummer named Brendan Burke and I had a group with him oh. in college. And uh, so I, I kind of came to Chicago to, to play with him and, and find out what was going on. And it was kind of motivated by that. Right, Brendan Burke, oh, I remember that. So we knew, when you came, was it sort of like the next, the period that I'm talking about now? Like, was, did Hot House exist yet? Uh, I forget when Hot House opened, but it it started right around then because I I I started playing there in '92, and Michael Zarin was a bartender there, and that's how that happened. Oh wow! Because he they didn't have I think it was Tuesday nights, and, and Marguerite wanted to have music, and Michael right. was the bartender, and we had started the Vandermark Quartet in January of that year, right. and it was kind of like well we have a band we could play on Tuesdays for you know five dollars or whatever you can afford and that's kind of how that that gig started i i have a, a lot of memories of seeing the first version of the vandermark quartet at hot house okay with, with oh is of it christy chiera christy chiera the blitzoids <laughs> i'm 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 not kidding you the that was when i first because i didn't know you then and i saw that christy chiera was in a band i'm like isn't that the guy from the Blitzoids? <laughs> I didn't even know about that part. I just Blitzoids, knew that he... Yeah, the, I mean, you know who they were? No, no, no. The Blitzoids was... So then we have to go back a bit to like the early 80s when uh, like the sort of... Sort of very West Coast oriented like American underground, like the Residents, Ralph Records, the Ronaldo and the... Well, that's not American. But they were like, for some reason what you know people would call weird music or whatever you know uh a lot of it was coming out of champaign illinois not mm. chicago there wasn't much of a scene for that kind of stuff in chicago itself mm. but champaign illinois was like this hotbed of midwest weirdo music huh. and christy chiara had a band i believe with his brother called the blitzoids and a lot of people consider them like you know the midwest's residents Oh, okay. And and so that's how I, I mean, I'm personally not a big fan of that kind of stuff. But that's they're they're one. I think they only made one record, but you could get it everywhere because it was really well distributed. Mm. I think maybe it was on Subterranean. So I saw in the reader, you know, an ad, you know a listing for, and I was like, why is the guy from the Blitzoids playing here? <laughs> so I went to see, and I was uh, very happy that it wasn't like you know. Uh -huh. and when you guys came out, you know, not wearing goofy costumes or anything, I was I was very happy that it wasn't going to be like, you know, <laughs> the residents or anything like that. But uh, 
So that was the first time I saw you was at Hot House. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to move back to Boston, actually, because when I first got to Chicago, um, those two years were like the toughest years for me in terms of playing music. I had a really hard time. I mean, I did play with some people. Like, I, uh, I was played with Damon Short for a while, and, and uh, there were a couple smaller projects, but they never, like, got traction. Short, Short yeah. And, uh, and th then in... And actually, I, I, I started playing with Hal Russell, like I think right. in 1990, when Mars had left the group for a little while. And then Mars came back in and they, they fired me. And like <laughs> things started off really well. Like when I got here, I was like, I was playing Hal Russell and blah, blah, blah. And then I got fired. And then it was like, you know, crickets for almost two years. It was like really rough. Like I just kind of practiced and wrote tunes. And Kent Kessler got in touch with me because I had done the stuff with Hal and he and Michael Zerang were putting together a band with Christy Chiara and they wanted a horn player. Kent remembered me. Right. And so they got in touch and I showed up to the first rehearsal with like this giant stack of tunes because all I'd been doing was like writing tunes in a basement for two right. years. You know? right. And uh, so we, we hit it off and, and, and we were like, oh, what should we call it? And since I had like a lot of material, because that's what I was doing, uh, Michael Zerang said, oh, we should call it the Vandermark Quartet, huh. which I'm sure he regrets to this day. Because <laughs> 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 and uh, we started playing, you know, doing shows. We did, uh, yeah, stuff around town, probably about once a month or so we were playing. And then this opportunity opened up at Hot House. And I was like, really already talking about going back to Boston. And Michael was the reason I stayed in Chicago. He said, man, we just started this band, like stick around, give it a year, like just see what mm -hmm. happens here. And that was really a major turning point, like really probably the turning point that kept me in Chicago. And then we started the thing at, at Hot House, I think later in 92, and we did the Tuesday nights, the, the weekly thing. And I remember, I remember Marguerite saying, the Vandermark Quartet sounds like a chocolate box, like a, a candy collection. Like, why are you calling it the Vandermark Quartet? <laughs> so, yeah, we hit it off right away. <laughs> is those two years you were talking about, is that the is that like where the Lutenbachers happened? Yeah, well, that's a good question. That's a good question. My memory for dates is, is bad, but it could have been in that period or right. Because no, it would have been after. It would have been really? after. Because I was, I was thinking for some reason I thought that that happened. That was basic originally. Hal Russell. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was because the Lutenbachers. That's really Hal Russell's last name. So the Flying ah. Lutenbachers is, is, is his name, and then he, uh, Weasel Walter, wanted to record something. I don't know the full story, but yeah. Hal wasn't interested in doing the recording or or something to that effect. And they asked me, and at that point. Um, that must have been after 92 because I was already sort of sticking around and I played with them for a little while uh, a year. And it was Chad, it was Chad Organ at that yeah, time, right? Yeah, Chad, Chad Organ was in the band, so it was Weasel, Chad and I and then then I think uh, Jet Bishop joined yeah. for a while and played guitar yeah. yeah, yeah. So, well, so he that, played guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah. Jet Bishop played guitar in the Vandermark, the first uh, version of the Vandermark 5 he was playing guitar really? and trombone. yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. I didn't know that. Yeah. Was yeah. Jeb, Jeb also, was he from Boston? Jeb? Yeah. No, he was, he was from the Chapel Hill area. I can't remember. Chapel Hill, probably. that's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, okay. he went to Chicago so in that, that, that um, At that time, I was, I was thinking the year that you decided to stay, at that time, Chicago was probably a lot cheaper to live in than Boston, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Like when I moved in with Ellen, we shared, it was bigger than a studio. It was like, I had a living room and had like a kitchenette area and a bedroom and a bathroom. And it was like $300 a month. Wow. Yeah. And there, that's not, I mean, I don't, I don't know when Chicago got expensive. I've, I've been told it's not cheap anymore. It's, but, it's uh, not, I mean, you, you know, it's like if you, because, because Chicago is like not bound by anything except water on one side, you know, it could kind of expand out and out. Right, but right. Uh, you know, we moved to where we live now, which is on uh, Ashland by Foster, and there's no way we could afford to move here now. 
where we right. live. There's just no way. So we, we got in when we were we were fortunate enough. But yeah, the the, the rents have totally uh, totally. Uh, Jeb is Jeb is watching. Okay. He, he just said he played bass and trombone. I remember him playing. Oh, it's bass. Okay. Okay. Cool. It's I did bass. remember him playing trombone. Yeah. <laughs> um, when you and curious, just because I have no experience with the the jazz world in Boston, is I mean maybe I'm sure it's different now, but at that time was like tech because of like all the the schools and everything was like tech was everything was it really technical jazz happening in Boston? Well, I was totally not connected to any of the conservatories there. Right, I was right. Like, you know, DIY kind of figuring out how to play on my own. Yeah. Um, and none of the people in the conservatories, I mean, very rarely went to shows, period. I mean, wow. I mean anybody, you know, like when you have great players come in, you know, often you wouldn't see them at the shows. So we, I had a group called uh, the Lombard Street Trio with Kurt Newton and Jeff Lippman. Um, and we... And that's actually where I met John Corbett. It was in that period, like in, he was still living in Boston at that time, in right? Boston. So I met him in Boston, and then and then kind of connected with him when I came back when I came to Chicago later. Um, but we would do shows about once a month at a place called The Willow in Somerville. So it was like I was or and I was playing with a, a group named Debris. Uh, oh yeah, I remember doing, that. Yeah, I was working in that in that band too. And so I was like doing things like on a monthly, you know, twice a month basis. And when I came to Chicago, it got it got complicated for me. And it was it was really tough for a while. But there was a lot of music happening, so I was able to go see shows yeah. in that period before I actually got some a chance to play with the, the Vermeer Quartet. Yeah, the first I remember the first few oh, no, the first few times that I met John, he was still living in because this 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 is sort this, I mean Leo Krumholtz is probably the fulcrum for all of this, isn't it? Because I remember the first, at least the times that I met John when he came to Chicago before he actually moved to Chicago was he was coming to see or help maybe even help Leo. Maybe John did the show in Boston of like you mm -hmm. know like say Peter Brotsman was doing a tour or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, for sure. George, and, George, and, George. and 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 then but he would come to the Chicago shows. Oh, okay. Okay. and and help out on i remember i remember specifically him helping out at the Bratzman and davy williams and ladonna smith show wow. and that's a com that's a combination that did that, they play uh, as a trio yeah wow how did that I, how did that work i've got a, i've got a great story about that okay please I, share it i i'm i'm mr Bratzman. do not get upset with the story uh, <laughs> so so at that time, you probably you probably remember Davy Williams had a he did like the Xerox magazine called the Improviser, which was uh, like kind of like the the Bible for that stuff in Amer you know for that kind of homegrown American improv you know like Eugene Chadbourne shaking Re shaking Le Ray Levi's you know the kind like very kind of a mix of like what I was talking about before about like that the Blitzoids and that sort of weird Americana and improv kind of mix world. Um, Oh, and uh, what's uh, it doesn't matter. It's also <laughs> uh, uh, so I knew I already knew Davy and Eugene Chadbourne through that sort of because it was it was all sort of still very cassette. You know, it was also that cassette culture happening in the eighties. You know, that, and so Davy wrote to me and said, "Well, I'm going to be playing in Chicago, but we're traveling in a car and I don't have an amp. Can I borrow an amp?" And I was like, oh, okay. And I had this like Roland Cube, which was like a like, real piece of crap amp. But uh, so I was like, okay, I'll bring it along. And so I go to the place and this was maybe, I, I remember correctly, the show was like at Columbia University or something like that. I don't know. But anyway, so I get there, before, you know, like when they arrive so they can do sound check. And, you know, I give David the amp and he's like, oh, thanks. You know, he was a really nice guy. And Mr. Brodsman was there and as you know at that time it was really hard at that particular time to get fmp records in america because the only distributor was cadence oh okay yeah north and, country yeah yeah and if 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 uh if some of the people listening the one or two people listening uh don't know the thing with cadence is you couldn't you couldn't just order records you had to i forget what it was but it was something weird like you had to subscribe to their magazine or something probably yeah yeah you know it was something yeah. like real so that was and it was they were in canada i believe and they made socks their main their main business was <laughs> making socks 
I mean, that this is what I remember. I might be wrong. But anyway, so like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to get a lot of Bronson's records during that time. They were really hard to get. And so this was the period where Bronson was like in a uh, black, like long black leather jacket all the time. So, uh, so, you know, Davey goes, you know, like, oh, hey, uh, uh, hey, Peter, this is my friend Jim. He brought an amp for us to use today. And I was, brought, <laughs> and I was, I was terrified of him. You know, I was, I was really, I mean, I'd never seen him before. I mean, I only, you know, I knew his, I knew some of the music, but, you know, the pictures on the records that I knew, you know, it looked like he was going to, you know, (laughs) jump out and grab me. So so I I finally, you know, they're, they're sound checking and I'm sitting there and they finish sound check and I, I decide, okay, this is my only chance. And I go up to Mr. Brassman and I say, Mr. Brassman, by chance, did you bring any records today to sell? Like, is there going to be a table or anything? He's like, no. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. I was like, I was like, wow, well, you know, I, I, I've been having a, a hard time finding your records. And uh, I was, is there maybe any suggestion you can give? And he just kind of stared at me. You know, he's much taller than me. And he opens up his, his leather jacket and pulls out a flask, opens it up, takes a swig, closes it again, puts it in the pocket and goes, good luck. <laughs> That's great. And how was the gig? I mean, I'm just great. curious. Yeah. It was great. Wow. Uh, it's a, it's I mean, interesting mix of folks. LaDonna, Davey LaDonna, I mean, maybe, I mean, I mean, I'm, I don't think their records are really available anymore, are they? It's it's hard, I think, to find them. I think a lot of folks aren't aware of, of the work, you know. Yeah. We had we had uh, Donna Smith on the Option series. I oh. think it was last year, which was really cool that that happened and stuff. And oh, that's great. yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, they're amazing, amazing people. They're yeah, amazing. yeah. It's really unfortunate. <laughs> Sorry, this <is> music. <laughs> um, uh, I'm gonna have to move this because that's gonna make me. The song's gonna make me laugh. Uh, uh, yeah, because Davy Smith is really, really unrecognized. Mm-hmm. He was an amazing, amazing guitar player, a great improviser. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, really unrecognized, sadly. Uh, Can I ask you a question about a guitar yeah. player? That kind of connects to this period. Can you talk a little bit about uh, Derek Bailey and how you ended up? kind of connecting with him and his impact on you like as a younger player because that's amazing to me the, well, the, the first time I heard him was by accident really because uh because there was those those two records on ECN basically oh, okay uh, and you know Chicago actually has a really I mean I think a lot of cities in the states have it I mean here in Japan they don't so I take it but like this inner loan interlibrary loan system where, you know, if your library doesn't have it, you, they'll get it from another library for you, you know. Mm-hmm. So at some point in high school, I was like, you know, obsessed with ECM. You know, I loved ECM. I was really, really into, you know, this is like still a good period. This is like 70s ECM, you know, early 80s. So, um, um, uh, sorry. <laughs> You put it together, Jim. I know. <laughs> this, this track always makes me laugh. Um, they're doing their best. Uh, so uh, so I was checking out all the ECM records, and then I got the uh, the Dave Holland, Derek Bailey duo record. Oh, wow. Which is basically, I mean, it sounded like insect music, you know? <laughs> so that got me interested in it. Then I sort of cross-checked and... I forget what the next record I got of his, but like I'd never heard anything like that before, obviously. And then not too long after it, I got a chance to see him play in Chicago. Uh, I forget who I first saw him with. And then I saw him in Milwaukee with Min Tanaka. Wow. And then- In Milwaukee? In Milwaukee, yeah. They did a tour together? They did. Wow. I don't know how many shows they did, but there was one in Milwaukee at a, wow. I believe, a bookstore, if I remember correctly. Okay. And then uh, there was actually, there was a trio 
that's completely undocumented, um, although there are recordings, of Min Tanaka, Garrick, and, uh, and Milford Graves. Wow. And they did a tour of Japan. I know there's recordings of that tour somewhere. Wow. But, uh, but yeah, there was it. But anyway, and so then fairly also simultaneously with this, uh, one thing I understand, my, uh, when I was in high school, during the summer, we would sometimes go to Ireland because my parents are from Ireland. And there's not much family there at all, but there was a little. But my mother had a stepsister who lived in London. And uh, and I was already working. Just My parents had to work like from when they were eight, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, uh, okay. that, that kind of situation. So uh, even though it's, you know, it was illegal, you know, I had to be pretty much working by I was 13. I was working in a, uh, in a, uh, a potentiometer factory, actually, you know, like the knob, the, the really? inside of knobs. Yeah, yeah. As my a 13-year-old? Sister, yeah. My sister's then boyfriend, who later became her husband, he worked there as a machinist. And so he got me a job there. And it was my job after school to, uh, to, um, like in the back, I would clean up all the, the metal lathing things and all that stuff. But then there was this room, the, the, the little card that's inside the potentiometer it has the wire wound around it. It has to be blasted with some sort of baking soda solution and then dipped in acid. So there was this, these two rooms. There was one room that was just a concrete room. On, on on the floor, it was the whole floor was just covered with this like this, like white baking soda solution, and there was an air compressor in there. It looked like something out of like Tarkovsky's uh, you know soccer <laughs> or something. Like that. So I'd have to go in there and clean that room, and then the next room was the acid room. So I'd have I'd have to take these big jars of acid and like change things of acid. So anyway, I'm doing this work to get this money a to buy a computer and to buy records. Wow. So I I saved I saved that money up. And the next time we went to Ireland, I like begged my parents to let me just go to London because I wanted to go to London to buy records. And there, there was this aunt there that I could stay with. So I saved up the money to get the hydrofoil, which I don't know if it still exists, but it's, it was like this boat that has like a balloon on the bottom. And the hydrofoil would go to Ireland, to England. So you see, we're maybe 15 or 16, I go to London so I can like, you know, buy records you know go to john moore's and all that and i just i just wrote to derek before i went and i said i i'm i'm coming to london i want to buy records on incus can i come over <laughs> and, wow. and and i went to his house and you know he made me tea and then he opened this closet and it was like it was like you know, opening you know the door into the the sixth realm of of heaven and it was a <laughs> closet with the entire incus stock in there you know, oh which God. was still just vinyl at that time, and, and I just I just went in there, and I didn't I knew I didn't have the money for all of these, but I just took a copy of everything I didn't have, wow. and he actually ended up giving them to me for what I had. Wow! So like I pretty much bought up to that point the entire Incas catalog. Uh, I skipped a few. If Derek wasn't on it, I skipped them, <laughs> which is so <laughs> horrible to say, but I did. And and then he just sort of stayed in touch with me. And he, when he would come to Chicago, he would uh, he would uh, like either want to borrow a guitar. Like he one time he came to film his BBC special, the, uh, the improvisation. He was coming to Chicago to film uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Lewis, George Lewis. Okay. And uh, since he was he wasn't coming to play a show, he was just coming to film he wanted to borrow a guitar so he could practice while he was in Chicago. And at the time, the only guitar I had was this like Roland guitar synthesizer. <laughs> <laughs> but the guitar itself was actually really, really nice. But you know, it's like a Roland guitar synthesizer. So, I mean, you can play it without the synth. So I, I take it to Derek, <laughs> like here, you could use this. So I got to see Derek play a Roland guitar synthesizer, which was fun. <laughs> but. But then that's the year he asked me to play a company he, the next year at Company Week in 1990. Wow. And and so how I went over. At that time? How old were you then? 2021. 20, wow. And how, uh, 
I mean, obviously, he knew you were a guitar player, clearly, but had he, had he heard you play at all? Yeah, he, he had he had some, like, sex. Oh, okay. Okay, so he, he, he chucked he, you out. He, he would tell people, he's like, he sounds like Keith Rowe if he was in Blade Runner. <laughs> that's, how he, that's how he would describe me to people. <laughs> Because, because it was funny because Henry Kaiser was playing at that at that company week. It was a strangely guitar sent guitar oriented company week. Eugene Chadbourne was playing. I don't think I don't think Dave Davy was playing, but Henry Kaiser was coming, and that freaked me out because Henry Kaiser was like amazing to me. I mean, the "It's a Wonderful Life" record was like it's like one of the key things in my life, and so you know I hadn't met him, but I was like. Oh my God, I was like freaked out. So I'm at my aunt's house and Derek calls up and and he's like, you know, I'm not going to attempt the invitation, but you know, he's like, he's like, oh, Henry arrived and he he called me. He wants to know who the hell you are. He's like, and, and Henry was asking, is he imitating me? Is he imitating you? Is he imitating Eugene? <laughs> <laughs> and then he's, you know, he's, he, oh, Keith Rowe was actually also playing at that company week, actually. So it was like really guitar centric. So that's how I met Henry, because Henry decided he wanted to meet me before the the company week started. And I guess he decided I was okay. And he's like sort of immediately put me under his arm. And Derek was also very, you know, nice and protective to me. So like I had these two like gods, like, you know, being nice to me. You know? oh, that's <laughs> and, amazing. You know, I mean, one thing, I think, and this isn't meant to sound, but but I, I, I've honestly thought about this a lot over the years, but that period of time in that world of music, there really weren't many people my age. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't think of, now I know of two or three other people who existed then, but that I had nobody, I was not playing with anybody my own age. They were mm -hmm. all like 10 years, at least 10 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's not something I realize the implications of until much later in life but that's but that's neither here or there um but uh so one thing happened at the company well a lot of things happened at the company week but um one thing that happened that was really important in my life was uh i was hanging outside with henry and there was some I don't, it doesn't matter who it was but someone because henry kaiser is like sort of an expert on captain beefheart music you know and so a lot of people know him from that. And so somebody comes up to him and they asked him, they said, oh, Henry, this one particular Captain Beefheart song, what, what time signature is it this, this song in? And Henry said, they're all in one. <laughs> and that, I mean, it sounds silly now, but like I was 21 years old and it blew my mind. It completely blew my mind. Like I had never, it, it like took me out of thinking like a musician really for the first profound point, first time in my life, oh, wow. you know. Okay, wow. And that was really, and to this day, that was like a really heavy for me. Yeah. For all in one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, and then when I came back to the States, Henry invited me out to California to organize his record collection. But it was really, which which I did, but it was he. It was basically him making an excuse to like introduce me to people and stuff like that. Wow. So I went out there, and it, I, maybe unintendedly, the most amazing thing was, you know, he had this like unbelievable record collection. So, so I go out there and I'm organizing just like the the free jazz guitar section, and I'm like. Lauren Mazakane, who's Lauren Mazakane? KG Haino, you know, Ray Russell, you know, uh, Masayuki Taki and Taki and Agi, I actually knew about beforehand, but that's but like, but like, it was like a crash course, yeah, on like, yeah. like the even the the low, the lower, uh, more underground free jazz, uh, music that I didn't know about, and then, uh, and you know. Henry was just like introducing me to people out there and he had solo gigs that he just decided on the spot were going to be duo gigs with me. You know? Wow. Wow. So that's amazing. Yeah. So 1990 is a real pivotal year for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, basically because of Derek and Henry, it was, you know, 
And and how did you get into, I mean, because when I first started encountering you and knowing a little bit more about what you were doing, a lot of it was connected to, let's say, for lack of a better word, more rock-oriented or underground experimental rock stuff. I mean, so far everything you've talked about has been really connected to improvised music or free improvisation or variants on that. Um, what's the rock connection or is that already there and it just no of... it the thing is it's not even a rock connection i have to go back a bit okay uh to when i was in college because really my my main like the core of my interest is like you know electronic composition you know modern whatever you know that stuff but when i was in college the one thing that was good i mean i was like uh you know oh here's henry uh mm -hmm. Um, that was my main interest, and there was no support for that at college. I mean, no, none of the, the professors at DePaul made that kind of music, knew how to make that music, and um, and in the academic world, that music. I mean, I'm reducing a big conversation to something very small sort of reduces it basically to demonstration of technology you know i'm i'm over exaggerating but simultaneously during that time there was a lot of music especially coming out of europe uh like the half la trio or p16 d4 or uh people like that who were making music that was while maybe not with the same formal interests was dealing with the same sort of sound material, the same kind of language as this music that I loved a lot, especially like coming out of like Inesrim stuff like Pierre Henri and Luc Ferrari and, and Evo Malik and Parmigiani, which I was like crazy about at that mm. time. That was like my bread and butter, you know, like Luc Ferrari. But there was this music happening outside of academia, outside of so-called, you know, composition that I found had a lot of the elements of this music but also had some elements that the school of music that I was interested in didn't have. And because they were releasing them basically on the equivalent of like punk rock labels, but you know, you know, independent labels, I started to think about the context of everything a lot. Mm -hmm. I started, and more and more context became everything for me. So I purposely started putting, you know, that's, I, I realized this is the world where I should be putting my efforts into. It's like I don't have to be a composer, you know. Who, you know, I mean, the, the things. Were, the the one thing about going to DePaul that really helped was not anything they taught me, but that I was forced into a situation where I had to learn to articulate why I thought they were wrong, mm -hmm. not just feeling they were wrong. I had to learn how to articulate it and, and sort of realize I had to not only develop an aesthetic and and work on it but actually just realize what the hell that is in the first place so that so during that period where i was doing a lot of improvising you know like the the music i was making as a whatever you want to call it, composer although i didn't want to use that word i was putting that stuff out on labels on labels i was thinking that like these these are not works i'm making a record that's sort of the context i was thinking of mm -hmm. so to jump back to your question Basically, what was happening during that time was I was trying to move, I wanted to move that into a new context. It's not so much that I, and it was also happening simultaneously with me beginning to work more regularly as a, as a recording engineer and actually starting to be able to pay the bills with that. And the thing I wanted to do was I'm going to pay the bills by being a recording engineer so that I don't, I don't want what I want to do to have anything to do with making a living. You know, if I, if I make money on it, great. But mm -hmm. like I want, I I got this sort of okay skill now at recording. I can do this, and I can learn from it. Which I, things I learned from that, I can use mm -hmm. in what I want to do. So they they're feeding back okay. And as you know, I mean, at that time in Chicago, people people that's when pe people from outside, new people from outside, started coming in. And uh, I mean, in my mind. I was just changing the context. I mean, it's it's more complicated than that, but that's where I was coming from. Mm -hmm. You know, I I never played rock guitar before then. I, you know, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I didn't. I was you know never in a band. 
you know. <laughs> so by changing the context, just so I understand better, you're talking about taking the sound world that you were interested in, the kinds of, of playing you were interested in, yeah. and putting it into uh, what you were hearing, like well, let's say with the Halfler Trio, that kind of world. Of well, I, I wanted records. to see if those those things, that way of approaching it, and not only that, it's just even the like the skills that I learned from doing that, because uh, it crossed over at first in the way that like I was recording when I'd re be recording bands, I'd be using a lot of techniques that made sense when you make tape music or you're or you're working with this kind of stuff or whatever, but isn't really natural to like traditional engineering, you know, recording a rock band. And I was really like, like one, one simple example, like uh, when I would mix, I mean, now it's, it's different, but when I would mix, instead of using a compressor, I would like rehearse, I would, I would like learn the part on the fader. And then when I'd mix, I'd actually, you know, I'd actually rehearse the mix. So that, you know, because I didn't, I wasn't able to work in studios that, at that time that had like, you know, an SSL console with like automatic or whatever. Mm. And for me, it was very normal for making like tape pieces at home, you know, it was very normal for me to like think about rehearsing the mix, you know, and I was doing stuff like that. Instead of using a compressor, I would actually, you know, manually like basically ride the fader and other engineers would look at me and like, what, what, you know, what are you doing? That's really weird. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't thought about that because I had learned basically how to engineer from making tape music. I see. Yeah. And then by working in regular studios, I studied up on like, okay, that, that that's this mic does that because of this, you know. And you know, some great people like Steve Albini was very helpful early on when I started recording regular music. And very very kind and and great. Um, um, what's the word for it? and sharing their knowledge and stuff so it's like that and then with that sort of influx of new people and me thinking about like changing basically changing the scenery you know it's like up till now i've used you know it's like you've been you've been running a play now for a year and you've been using this this stage setup and this lighting scheme and basically my way of thinking is like it's time to change the change the see change the lighting s scheme and see what happens mm -hmm. and you know i there was yeah i mean they, that's how it started at least you know mm -hmm. and, what about the what about the rhythmic sensibility like i mean how how how, how would you is that's a big leap in there if you're talking yeah. about tape music and the, the other more uh, freely improvised music from Europe or what Henry Kaiser was doing. I mean, it's a, I mean, not all Kaiser stuff, no, but you no, know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, so how how did you latch on to, if, let's say, just to pick a group that you were like uh, Breeze Glass or Gastro Soul? Like, there's there's a strong yeah. rhythmic context in there that's very different. Than, well, with Breeze Glass, which which I completely approached as making a tape piece. Like I was making like a, a documentary of a band that never gets to rock, basically. But like with Tim Jones, you had a drummer who could play a, a like a, a a can and it would sound like a, a like a you know a, a mountain falling down. So that was a little different. But I did have a lot of problems with rhythm then, and I still do to this day. Uh, mm -hmm. Not like not me. Like I still don't know what my. I still don't know where I stand in terms of rhythm. Hmm. Can you explain what you mean by that? I don't know who I am in it. I don't know what it is I want to do with it, really. Um, I know the things I like when I hear it. It's sort of, it's, I, I think it has something to do with my uh, personality might not be the right word, but anytime I've ever played drums and I, I played drums on some things and like I'm embarrassed the second I hit something because it's loud like I want I want the drum set to be quieter and it's not because I, I don't like loud sound it's because I'm embarrassed like I'm immediately embarrassed that I've made this sound mm -hmm. that is probably going to be intrusive on something <laughs> <laughs> but what, oh. what about when you have oh, oh, you some, have some oh, uh, what, what okay. happened what about you know, you have somebody like, let's say, Tim Jones. Like, yeah. he's taking care of that role, so to speak. Yeah, he was. He was. He was like totally taking care of that. That was like yeah. that was his thing. Mm -hmm. 
so that was kind of a different situation. Uh, I mean, basically, the only time I ever felt I had the right to tell anyone what to, and the only time I ever did was my own records with Glenn. And, you know, Glenn is like a genius. So it was kind of a pleasure. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I could say, okay, Glenn, what you do in the second measure, fine. But from that point, take, take your, what you're doing on the hi hat, move it ahead an eighth note and take the bass drum and move it back a whole note every second measure. And he's just going, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I've actually never, ever met anyone who can do that. I mean, I know there are. But the key thing is, then it comes out as music. There's thousands of techno, you know, like Vinnie Kaliuri, all these guys, they could do, you know, 3D chess in their head. But there's, there has to have, it's, it's, it's a problem with me with drums. There has to be a, a certain sense of modesty in the way the drums are played hmm. for me to feel okay with it. I mean, I, I mean, I. How do you mean modesty? Like, like not technically flashy? Or? I don't. Well, definitely that. Yeah. I don't want to hear the technique at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I know you're. I want fan. it to be. I want it to be exactly what I want, but I don't <laughs> want to hear it. Okay. You, know I mean? you don't want to, you, you don't want to hear the way it was constructed. You. Want I don't want to foreground it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 That's it. That's super. So you you got in that period. So like, let's say, you know, who, you know, just just very quickly. Yeah. A perfect example of a drummer who does that is Paul Modian. Ah. Uh, for me. Yeah. 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 That's an to me to me Paul Mod, Paul Modian's an amazing drummer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. He like hits all those things I'm talking about. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. Okay, that's a, no, that's a great reference to have like a an oral image. You know what I mean of, of what you're talking about. So when you so we're talking like. Post 90, like there's this pivot period, this, this breakthrough, like amazing set of things happen in 90. And then you start changing the context for some of the music you're working on, creating like, let's say, uh, I can't think of a better word, but like bringing that context into set more rock elements or rhythm, rhythmically connected to that kind of stuff. And what was Chicago for you at that point? Like you're you're now recording people, you're now making records, you're now playing with a lot of visiting artists, you're 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 involved in all kinds of parts of the scene. What what is it that was going on that was most inspiring for you at that time? Post ninety. Well, that, that 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 it's sort of odd because that simultaneously that's when I was spending more and more time in Europe. You yeah. know what I mean? Like I would be in Europe maybe half the year, like mm-hmm. from like 90 onwards until like 99. So, okay. so I had, there was like these two worlds almost, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of, a lot of things, a lot of, you know, a lot, you go to Europe and, you know, sh- Chicago was becoming like, sort of like, you know, the alternative New York in the eyes of, of people in Europe, especially mm-hmm. in, in improvised and jazz music world. So it was sort of weird actually because i remember yeah it was it was weird and sometimes it was kind of awkward because i didn't really want to be like some sort of uh what's what's the word for it uh uh person who goes to another country to represent a spokesperson or something like that spokesperson yeah you know uh yeah or yeah spokes diplomat yeah yeah diplomat And especially in Europe, it was kind of forced into that situation occasionally. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I'm being vague because it's it is kind of vague now. Mm-hmm. But there was there was some. It was a period of kind of in the way of losing. Like I was more increasingly losing myself into something that was becoming bigger than me, you know, and. Uh, which I think why eventually I sort of for a few years they just like went right, kind of put all my energy eventually into just like being a record producer, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, maybe more to to keep myself in. I mean, also like I wasn't very good at saying no to stuff, so maybe more in a way I didn't think I realized it at the time, but like to keep myself at least in, somewhat in one spot for 
for uh, like some amount of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, also my my I was I was being more in, I was I was getting slower with making my own things like the 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 tape music stuff. I mean, I was you know like it was getting okay for me to like take two or three years to make something. You know, so that that's like happening basically under everyone's noses because I'm just it's just me at home. So the technical side of of uh, of producing and recording people was becoming and it was you know it was it was like it was the last gasp of like uh, like that great period of time for studios and stuff because you know bands had like really they were still having like like good you know I was getting lunch on the, you know at the studio you know what I mean it sounds yeah. silly now but it was like it was it was it doesn't exist anymore unless you're like you know and it probably doesn't exist at all anymore but it was an amazing time and I was starting to get to work at real like real recording studios and stuff like the amazing Sear Sound or 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 Steve's uh, I didn't work too much at Steve's new studio but I mean these beautiful studios so it was it was very appealing uh it was a very appealing to me uh mm-hmm. and was sort of simultaneously moving me out of play. I was I was starting to play less and less, mm-hmm. and starting. It, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, no, go go ahead. Sorry, I was interrupting. I mean, I might be mi- kind of mixing up my times a bit, but you yeah, know. I was I was just kind of wondering, like this period you're talking about, like roughly what years are we? Are we like from '98 onwards? Okay. Okay. In '90s, '90s, maybe '97. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, yeah, like '90. It might even be far back as 96 because that's when i think when the stereo lab i did in london stereo lab record was maybe 96. so yeah like the last four years of the 90s i i mean that's the most memories i have of that time is like working on other people's records mm-hmm. and i i think i think i was in some sort of phase of trying to remove myself from the equation completely maybe the, the performance <laughs> equation or the the scene equation or, or not the not know. the scene equation because I've never you know I mean as you know I'm not, I'm not that social <laughs> yes and no <laughs> well I mean it's not like I'm a, like sitting in the corner oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm not I'm not on the scene but uh, I think I was just trying to room I just wanted I wanted it to be in the work. I just wanted it to be about the work, you know? Mm-hmm. And in that um, period, let's say, cause we're running up to an hour now and it's, I wish we could go on for a long time. Cause there's, we're not even to 2000. We'll go on a little longer, but I don't want to take up your whole, uh, oh. whole thing. And, and then and ESS also has to do a show, uh, I oh. think in a, after this too, I can't remember right now cause I'm a little zoned out in my brain, but, but in that last, four years of the nineties when you were working more as a, as an engineer and working on other people's work, what were you, what were we, you doing um, in terms of your own music? You're working on this tape music, these long term projects of yours, but yeah. what other, what was your like? You know, I, I made those song records, mm-hmm. which were, you know, whatever. They're, they're pretty uh, seminal. They're considered to be pretty seminal, Jim. <laughs> You're very self-deprecating. <laughs> yeah. I remember, I remember because you played on Eureka. I remember when you kindly came over to play. I remember I kept telling you to play more stupid, stupider, stupider. I said, think Saturday Night Live. I want Saturday Night Live. And you were so mortified. Well, I was so confused. I mean, I, 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 I didn't know what, what the music was going to be at all because I, I, you invited me to do this recording. And in my mind, I'm imagining, you know, the different kinds of things you've done. And I, I wasn't really familiar with, with the more, let's say, pop music interest you had. And, and so then you played me this track. And I had my mind going there to record in that room in your, your, your apartment. I, I was like, oh, it's going to be, I don't know, something like avant-garde, whatever, you know. And then you played the track. I forget the name of the track. That yeah, I played. It basically sounds like Pink Floyd, basically. Yeah, and I was like, <laughs> I, I was, I, my first thought was like, of all the people in the world to ask to play, like I am the wrong guy. But I, you know, I really wanted to to do it. I wanted to do a good job, and I kept trying you to. Did. And you, you kept saying, no, 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 <laughs> more like David Sanborn, more like, you know, like I'm like. 
I can't do this. And you go, yeah, exactly. That's why I want you to do it. I want you to do it. And and in the end, I you know, I guess finally I was able to put something together that, that worked or you were able to piece something together from some of the, the takes. But do you, I, I think I told you this, but like several years later, I was in Stockholm and uh, this this woman came up to me and and she was a friend of a musician I was playing with on a gig. And she said, is that really you on that track on Eureka? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And I, I was felt pretty proud of it. You know, I was like, yeah, it's me. You know, she goes, I, I can't believe that's you. I said, it's me. It's me. She goes, it sounds like a fucking porn soundtrack. <laughs> Success. <laughs> so you're vindicated. <laughs> I don't know if I am, but you are. But yeah. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah. So, so uh, I guess we can go a little longer if you're up for it. Sure. Do you sure. want? Do you want, sure. uh, do you want to? You want to Qu questions? Yeah. Well, we haven't had actually. Uh, <laughs> actually, we haven't had any questions that haven't mentioned that we'd be willing to uh, to do so. But here's a couple of questions that have come up. One is uh, the image on the wall behind you is by who? Yes. Uh, that's a that's an orchestra score by Roland Kane that was sent to me by his daughter because I've been, uh, I've been doing, uh, like audio restoration of his archive for her because I'm his number one fan and have been for almost 35 years. Wow. That's great. He's like my, my hero. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's his piece galaxies, which is actually an orchestra score. So that's what that is. Please uh, listen to Roland Kane at the Roland Kane band camp. Yeah, he's amazing. He, I, I wasn't aware of his work at all. And you mentioned that you were working on mastering some of his stuff. And I, I went and, and visited the band camp. And, the, and there's tons of amazing music there. It's, it's yeah. really, really incredible. I have another question. Uh, this is from Martin Freeman. Got any he's stories? The actor? I don't know. Maybe. Uh, got any stories from working uh, and performing with Tony Conrad? <laughs> well, that's uh, that's that's a whole twenty-four hour broadcast. Uh, <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, I was telling Ken earlier. I mean, Tony, just being with Tony, you needed uh, decompression time afterwards. Not like to just because everything about him and what he was saying was so dense with information, experience, knowledge, and outside thinking that you really needed time to like, not decompress to, to, well, I mean, I guess decom de de like you would decompress a file. Like you, had, you had to parse everything out. So it wasn't actually, the time with him was actually quite intense. And I think because of my age at the time, and I think I didn't, I unfortunately didn't, I wish I had worked harder for him and, and uh, so that I had more, I mean, it's not like I didn't work hard. I just, I wish I had had more time with him, frankly. I mean, it was, it was tough because it was just so intense, you know, um, uh, you know, it, it was kind of like a whirlwind uh, of not just information, just it's, it was just really like a, you know one of the one of the few people in my life where it was like a you know like an absolute uh, force of nature, you know. And so mm -hmm. he was he was really a remarkable. Oh, hey, hi, Lou. <laughs> so. Um, I recommend everybody uh, look up anything they can about Tony. And if it doesn't make sense, stick with it because something else he does will, will the context starts to grow. Cause he kind of, he kind of builds his own context mm -hmm. and, and that's a big part of understanding what he was doing because it was a very strong, both aesthetic and political element to what he was doing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah definitely especially in terms of aesthetics of being a person 
and the values you should have as a person involved in the work creative world. So yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great answer. Um, this this comes from Benjamin Bracken. Uh, remembering hanging out with Jim and Nicholsdorf with Peter R. Farmer's Manual Crew, etc. Uh, would love to hear about how he made those early Mago connections. Uh, I met, I had met Peter before that Nichols. I remember that Nichols Dark show. That was the first Fennelberg show. Uh, I met Peter, and I think I met Christian at the same time at a festival a year or two earlier in Austria. I was playing. Oh God, I forget who I was playing with, but it was this. I think it was a festival called Hyperstrings. And Eddie Prevost was there. I can't remember if I was playing with Eddie, which would make sense, or if Eddie was playing with uh, Paul Kember, E-A-R, and Earth was on the bill. <laughs> and it was this kind of weird half. And that was kind of the big, when, when Migo was sort of just beginning. And it wasn't, and it wasn't uh, com computer, really, it wasn't computer-based yet. But... I was playing a, a, a Mac 520C at that time. And so Peter was interested that I was using a Mac. And so we got friendly there. And then I forget who Christian and Peter were playing with at Nicholsdorf. But Peter was, or if he was playing at all, but Christian had like a rolling guitar synthesizer thing. And Peter had basically two CD players. But I had this 520C Mac, which is this old, really chunky, gray Mac. And so uh, I'm sorry that I forgot his name, the guy who runs Nickelstorf, really great guy. Oh, Hans Falb? Hans Falb. Hans or, or Matt's got the idea to have us play in the bar that night after the, all the shows were open. Because at this festival, as you, you know, Ken, uh, the festival ends when everyone falls asleep in the bar at 5 a.m. Uh, at least it, was, it seemed like it at that time. Yeah. So we played in the bar. And I remember some people were really, really pissed off about it. But I remember Matt's just going wild about it. And so soon after that, Peter and Christian and I decided we were going to do like a laptop group. Uh -huh. <laughs> and that's and that's how... Fennelberg was born. I don't know if we decided that or we decided to play together again. And the next time we got together, they both had laptops. So, what, what year What year was that, roughly? It's probably later than I think. Maybe 98. Mm -hmm. Okay. So really, no, really. 97, 97 or I think maybe 97. So pretty early in the, in the use of laptop. Yeah, I mean, the the only other person I knew at that time who played a laptop on stage, I mean, outside of academic music circles, uh, was uh, Marcus Pop, of all. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, we got another question. Uh, this is from Matt W. Can you talk about the instruments used on Rec Room by Loose Fur, please? Rec Room? Which one's Rec Room? One second. I have. I don't. I don't know what. I don't know what song he's talking about. One second. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'm sure it's on YouTube. That was a long time ago. <laughs> Back room. Okay. Let's see. Okay. Just very quickly. I think. Is this the one with the extended ending? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think I, I think you know he, he probably wants to know about the end. Um, if I remember correctly, ba uh, it's, Jeff is playing the bass, and I'm playing the guitar type stuff in the keyboards, and then Glenn is playing drums, and he was also playing a hammered dulcimer he had. Then the end section is actually was actually from somewhere else. That was. Basically, we were setting up in the, the Wilco loft to record, and I was playing guitar, and Glenn was playing drums, and the, the, the whole end section has this weird vibe. That's actually Jeff playing a harmonica through a 
Electroharmonix Holy Grail Reverb Pedal. You got a good memory, Jim. So that's that's what was done on that. Well, okay. Uh, next up, uh, oh, go ahead. No, and interesting fact, except for vocals, everything on that record was recorded with SM57 mics. Oh, wow. What, uh, I, what, why did you decide to do that? I wanted to see what it would sound like. <laughs> <laughs> so I, we did a test, and it, it sounded good. So anyway. Oh, that, that's, they're, uh, that's they're cool very cheap thing. mics. Yeah. Um, this is a question from VV Lightbody. Jim, would I would love to know how you get into the creative zone. Do you have a routine, or does inspiration strike? What's your secret? Um, I don't have a secret. I, I guess I don't believe in that stuff. Is the, uh, the key thing, and I just uh, it's it, I. I mean, I wasn't as good this when I was younger, but I believe it. when it happens, it will happen. And uh, I make sure to be in a, in a, to be in that frame of mind that it will happen when it happens. Like thing, it's, things will converge when they do. And the key thing is you have to keep feeding yourself st stuff so that things do converge. So I guess my main thing is I study a lot. If I don't know how to do something, I learn how to do it. If I don't know why this formula works, I learn. And I trust that eventually, somewhere, either consciously or subconsciously, uh, those things will converge in a, in a way that either resonates with me or which my main way, you know, the, the kind of overriding thing with me is that it's like when I'm doing something, I'm I'm not looking for an answer to a question because the answer is the next question. So I mean, basically I, you, I do what I have to do to keep that way of thinking going. To keep the questions going, you mean? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Because there's a discipline to that. I think, I think that, I mean, uh, not to encroach on your answer at all, because that answer is like kind of the way I think about it is that you you're you're constantly doing the work towards searching the thing. You know what I mean? It's it's a it's it's not like waiting for the thing to come to you. You're you're chasing yeah. it and you're finding new ways to chase it and yeah. new questions to ask. And that's a discipline. Like that process isn't isn't at least for me isn't haphazard. Yeah. It's like I, I find something exciting. I want to go after it and pursue it. You know, it's yeah. it's it's an active process, not a passive one. Yeah, and a lot of it is not necessarily fun. You know, like <laughs> you know, like the math part of it. Like if I'm <laughs> studying some math thing, but you know, I mean, it isn't isn't all just you know music. I probably spend I probably spend ten times more time watching films than listening to records. So I mean, it all you know. It might be something I saw 10 years ago will finally give me a way of looking at something that I only knew about a week ago. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So It accumulates, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we got a few more minutes, so I'll keep going. Owen Kilfeather asks, could you, uh, could Jim, could you talk about uh, Aiko Ishibashi, please, the work with, with Aiko? <coughs> Aiko? Aiko, uh, sorry. Aiko. No, no, oh, no, 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 it's okay. I know, I understand. Um, I met Aiko about 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, uh, actually, oh, because I had finally met a drummer who was as good as, well, as close to Glenn Kochi as I had ever found, which is uh, Yamamoto Tatsuhisa. And so it was for the first time I started thinking of doing something with drums again. And... And I said, okay, uh, I want to find a keyboard player who, who will at least as somewhat know where I'm coming from, which uh, in that case, I said, oh, there's someone who likes Genesis. <laughs> it was a way of like cutting out all the Genesis. <laughs> and so he told me about her. And then, uh, so, and then simultaneously, she asked me to produce her record, Carapace. And then it just sort of went from there. 
and uh, worked with her on pretty much everything since. And working actually, as soon as this talk is over today, we'll return to working on something. <laughs> So uh, she's, you know, she's a real outlier here, you know. Uh, so uh, I'm, you know, obviously a big fan and a big supporter. And uh, <clears throat> I think she's getting, she's getting stronger and stronger and stronger every year. And I recommend everyone go out and buy the record she made last year on Drag City. It's a great record that should not be overlooked. Okay. Uh, the the dream my bones dream please okay. check it out super uh this connects a couple of dots uh it's from lou malazzi hey and he wants to know how do you get to japan uh <laughs> I'm sure that's a uh, short answer <laughs> a plane um <laughs> well i mean i i started coming to japan first time i came to japan was in 93 and uh that was basically just like a record searching operation for like Taki and Agi records and stuff like that. And, but then kind of overlapping with what I was talking about before, when I was starting to work as an engineer, I forget what record it was, but you know, in Japan, all that sort of post rock stuff and everything. I mean, that was like crazy huge here. And so people in Japan started wanting me to record them as well. And I would take any chance to go to Japan. I didn't, you know, I, I probably lowered my standards about <laughs> who I would record if they were in Japan. So I started coming over a lot. And I would, like in the 90s, I was coming over two to three times a year through the 90s. And just every time I had to leave, I would just be just depressed that I had to leave. And, uh, and then just, you know, then when I, at the end of my time in New York, I was just like, I realized like there's, I just, I've been avoiding this for too long. So I quit work completely for a year and I stayed in a, like what they call a monthly mansion, which is, there's a lot of these like um, apartment buildings in Japan because a lot of people have to go to the city where the company tells them, like say you're in Tokyo and this is, is no, you're gonna work at the Osaka office for the next year, you know, people just do it. So they have these like basically furnished apartments that people use when they're like, you know, living there for a year for the company. So there's a lot of those. So I lived in one of those for about a year, like in three month intervals because of the, uh, the visa. And for that year, I just sat in there during the day and just studied Japanese and worked on getting a visa because an artist visa is very difficult in Japan. And then at night going out because I knew a lot of people in Japan at this point and trying to apply what I'd learned that day. <laughs> <laughs> so I did that for about a year until I got a visa, you know, and I, t I was getting all, you know, I was getting a lot of work requests w during that year. Like I got asked to do, uh, to direct John Cage's uh, Your Opera which is like the kind of the biggest thing I've ever been asked to do even and, and, and since, but I had to turn it down. It was funny wow. because, you know, I said, no, I can't do it. I, I don't have a visa. And they're like, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's like, you, you, you don't get to decide. What <laughs> I want to get a visa. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. So, yeah. So I did that for a year and then, um, I got the visa, uh, and I had to fly back to the States. The first time you get a visa, you have to fly back to the States. So I fl flew back to the States, uh, went one day to New York, got it stamped, flew back to Japan, and haven't left since. So that's how I got to Japan. Wow. It's, it's amazing. It's a, your command of Japanese is so amazing to me. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a little shaky now. I, I only, now that I live in the countryside, I don't really... Okay. Uh, talk very much every day, so okay. it's a little, it's a little, it's a little rusty. Okay. Here's a question uh, from Julia Dreidel: Have you watched any good movies lately? Yes. Uh, uh, let me think. Uh, there's a Swedish uh, science fiction film from four years ago called Aniara, which is fantastic. Uh, I recommend the new Adam Curtis 
film. Uh, Can't Get You Out of My Head. Um, let me think. Honey, oh, I, this film got, lamb, this is not necessarily the best thing, but this film got very heavily critically uh, drubbed. Is that the word for it? Uh, but I, I absolutely think it's fantastic. Is Under the Silver Lake. Uh, I think that movie's great. Um, another really good film that got overlooked is Good Time by the Safdie brothers. That's really, really good. Uh, uh, in terms of, uh, I've seen a lot of okay films in the last few weeks. That's why I'm, I'm blanking a bit. I'm trying to think of anything that was like super great. I really recommend Aniara. That's really, really terrific. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, those are some. Yeah, that's, and I'll just, one last question, and we'll, we'll call it a night, if that's cool. Okay. And hopefully, uh, this is from Ohm Music. Uh, what's the angriest response to your music or your album covers you've ever been witness to? Album covers? Mm -hmm. Well, I or, know. Or music. Oh, well, I got you know, punched in the stomach at Nicholsdorf. Really? Remember, do, you remember, do you remember that guy who was at Nicholsdorf, the big fat guy who had uh, uh, suspenders? Oh yeah, really beard. like a giant yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, beard. yeah. After a set of Christian and me at Nickelsdorf, uh, just I was walking around. The guy just ran up to me, just hit me in the stomach. Are you serious? Yeah, because you you might remember it was like there was a lot of resistance for computers oh, yeah. at Nickelsdorf. At yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. In terms of the covers, I know the either the police were called or the police refused to let. Uh, other music, oh, OM music. This is probably this. This is a this is a plant. Uh, no, no, because, there's a band. There's a band in Chicago called. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's not a plant. <laughs> but this, this is a true story. Uh, other music used to have. I think they call them light boxes, where they it'd be like a blow up of the record cover in a mm -hmm. in a light box, and they put up one for Eureka, and either the cops went in or the cops were called, and they had the the, the a, a formal complaint was made against other music because of the Eureka cover. Okay. So that's the most extreme that I know of. Just do they know do they know something I don't know? I, I don't know. That's not in the question. Hey Jim, I want to thank you a lot oh, thank for, you. Uh, for hanging out and, and covering there's like so many questions that even I've got that we we didn't get to and, and hopefully we can do this again at some point yeah. and just catch up and I hope I get to see you in Japan really yeah. soon. I, yes. I always have a wonderful time. You're an amazing person to hang out with. The last time the last time I touched a guitar was when I played with you. I uh, there's a part of me where my heart breaks. I know you have to do what 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 you need <laughs> to do and but uh, there's a part of me that really hopes to get to play with you and you play guitar or anything well, if, again. If, if you when you come again I I will play it with you. That's a high compliment, Jim. I'm going to hold you to it, though. I'm going to hold you to it. I still, still can move them a little bit. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, everybody, uh, if you didn't know already, this is Jim O'Rourke, and oh. you're listening to uh, the Option Program, which is every Monday night at 7 o'clock on uh, YouTube now. Um, just check out the ESS.org, uh, get more information about the upcoming concerts, and Please tune into the quarantine concerts. ESS is doing huge thanks to Alex and Gleason to help with the tech tonight. Um, next Monday, uh, Junius Paul and Justin Dillard will be performing, and I'll be talking to Junius Paul about uh, his work. Uh, huge thanks, Jim. It's, uh, <laughs> Thank I miss you, you man. You. I miss you, and, and <laughs> it's been a, a wonderful night. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. I hope to see you Take soon, care. Jim. You too. Everyone keep safe. Yeah, you too. Take care, Jim. Take care.